Hello everyone, my name is Michael C. In. I am a PhD student in Guy Hoffman's Human Robot Collaboration Companionship Lab at Cornell University. Uh, I'll be presenting some work I was doing with Randy Gomez at my time at Honda Research Institute Japan, and the project is called Move AE, Modifying Affective Robot Movements Using Classifying Variational Autoencoders. So first, the survey some standard methods for creating affective robot movements. The lowest level would be manual trajectory planning, so this would be planning out individual degrees of freedom for the robot. A uh, higher level would be learning from demonstrations, so this can either be kinesthetic teaching, so physically moving a robot and having its encoders record its position, or teleoperation, so operating the robot remotely and having the robot record its movements to play back later. Orthogonal to this would be heuristic modification, so instead of creating new movements, uh, taking a set of existing movements and targeting certain parameters or features of the movement and modifying those in some way. So in this case, a four-legged robot, um, its step parameters such as the angle that it was walking and how quickly it was walking could be modified. Some drawbacks to these uh, would be that robot movements are typically pre-programmed and this leads to them being very repetitive. Uh, this usually stems from robot movement creation being very technical and specific to certain robots. Uh, it's not really something that end users are able to create uh, new robot movements and because these require uh, not just a high level of robotics in general, but a specialist knowledge in movement theory. So knowing which features and movement parameters to target and adjust. Uh, some methods or approaches to create new robot movements rely on older machine learning methods. So what we would try to see is how we can use new machine learning techniques, particularly from deep learning, to create new robot movements. So first as a background into the specific deep learning model that we used, uh, we used a VAE, which stands for a variational autoencoder. So basic vanilla autoencoders, uh, their job is to uh, encode the data into a smaller compressed uh, representation and then decode that data to generate a reconstruction of the input. Uh, VAEs take this a step further by trying to give the uh, the embedding space a known structure, usually in the form of a normal distribution. So how these models are trained is that they are given a data set and iterated back and forth to minimize some loss function. So the first part of this loss function would be reconstruction loss, so trying to match the reconstruction to the input, and also callback Liebler divergence, so trying to match that embedding space to that of a normal distribution centered around zero with a standard deviation of one. So the cool things that can be done with VAEs is that uh, new data samples can be generated just by sampling randomly in that known embedding space because the structure of it is known and then using the decoder of the VAE to generate new samples. So this uh, example comes from MNIST where new uh, images of digits were created just by randomly sampling and decoding uh, in the latent embedding space. So some related works that inspired our work um, within graphics Lots of work has been done using neural networks for learning motion sequences for animated characters. Uh, the example I used earlier uh, was a project called Geppetto, so they edited uh, robot gate parameters for this four-legged walking robot. Uh, going back to neural networks, uh, face feature editing, this has been seen in lots of popular apps such as FaceApp, uh, so they use a VAE trained on images of faces, and what they can do uh, is they can target specific features. So for example, eyeglasses in that second to last column, if they can figure out which images don't have eyeglasses and which images do have eyeglasses, they can create some eyeglass vector to add or remove glasses from arbitrary data samples. And that approach was also used uh, for music VAE, um, where they took the similar network and similar approach and applied it to music, and they can adjust certain parameters of music such as note density or pitch just by uh, playing around with arithmetic in the embedding space. So for our specific implementation, uh, we use our Blossom robot, so it has four degrees of freedom in its head platform. Uh, we ask volunteers to create approximately 80 happy, sad, and angry movements by puppeteering the robot using a phone application. Uh, these movements are recorded at 10 hertz. We split them up into three seconds because neural networks and these kinds of models require standardized input sizes. Uh, we also augment the movements, so uh, we do mirroring. So if the mo robot moves right, we also make a copy that moves left. Uh, we also share the degrees of freedom, so slide the timing of degrees of freedom slightly to generate new samples. And from this, we can get a data set of around 5,000 samples. The architecture that we used was in the form of a classifying VAE. So again, we have that VAE structure to use the encoder to compress the original 
input movement and then decode it to reconstruct it. Uh, we also add on an additional classifier that operates on the embedding space uh, to ensure that each emotion class in that embedding space is separated so happy and angry are not mixed and same with sad. Uh, after this, we further have to use linear regression to map from that 4D dimensional embedding space down to 2D valence and arousal space because uh, the learned embedding space does not have any uh, meaningful affective content or meaning that's human readable. Um, so we, we map onto the circumplex model of emotions, uh, which reconciles the discrete and continuous representation of emotions. So happy and angry would be same high arousal level, but angry is much lower valence, uh, and then angry and sad comparatively, sad has much lower arousal than angry. So for training, like with uh, many neural network models and uh, projects, we just determine the parameters empirically. Uh, we can monitor the training performance, so these are the uh, training curves, and we see that they level off by the time we stop training. So we can monitor the reconstructions to see how well uh, the VAE is doing its job. So here uh, at the top are the originals and the bottoms are the reconstructions. And you can see the reconstructions capture much of the same trajectories as the originals. Uh, it loses out a little bit on the exaggeration, but that's to be expected because we don't have a very large data set and the network is also trying to classify the movements at the same time. So for classification, we can monitor that by passing the embeddings through TensorFlow's projector and looking at a Tizni representation representation of how well the embeddings are separated. And we can see that the happy and angry movements are separated but mixing a little bit, but they're very well separated from the sad movements. So to achieve modification, again, we use linear regression to map from 40 dimensions to the 2D valence and arousal model. Um, so we do this by taking the centroids of each emotion class, so say all the happy movements, and mapping that 4 dimensional representation to a 2D re representation in the valence arousal space. So we map the happy movements to quadrant 1, 1 uh, in the valence and arousal space, and we do the same for angry at negative 1, comma 1, and uh, sad is approximately at negative 1, negative 1. Once we have this, each data sample in our data set has a valence and arousal score, so we can take um, for uh, valence, we can take the high valence movements and the low valence movements, uh, calculate the means of each group in the 4D dimensional space, and then subtract them to get a sort of valence vector that we can use to add or subtract valence to any arbitrary data sample. And we do this again for arousal. So this is a demonstration of the workflow for modifying a movement. So first we select a happy movement in that green area. So here, Blossom's kind of looking up and tilting its head. And then we can use the sliders to adjust the arousal and valence, move it into the blue sad space. And now we can see that the movement retains some of the characteristics of the original movement, but now conveys a different emotion. So to subjectively uh, verify our approach, we had a Mechanical Turk survey where we showed videos of originally uh, manually crafted movements and movements modified to be a different emotion, followed by this survey that asked uh, how well each emotion is exhibited, followed by a forced choice as to which movement or which emotion the robot is expressing. So our first hypothesis is that movements modified will display the target emotion with the same accuracy as the original uh, movements. So say a happy movement modified to be sad would show sadness and be recognized as sadness as the same as movements that were originally sad. We found that this was true for happy to sad and sad to angry movements. And our second hypothesis was that a movement modified um, will show that intended emotion with the same level of legibility as movements originally from that emotion. So a happy to sad movement will show sadness with the same level of intensity as a movement that was originally set. And we found that this was valid for all movement modification uh, combinations. So in summary, uh, we have a method to modify valence and arousal for a ro robot's effective movements by editing a neural network's learned latent embedding space. Um, from the survey, the results suggest that not all modifications are equally achievable. Um, and also that the expressiveness of our platform is limited, particularly in terms of angry. Um, even normally angry movements were difficult to recognize. Uh, for future work, we'd want to expand to more robots and do experiments with other applications for neural networks for robot behavior generation and ideally have more interactive applications. Thank you.